Greetings, ladies and managers, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called Humans Don't Duck, written by John Galt. Zarnath sat squat, hands clinging to his rifle like a lifeline. He counted down slowly, 20 seconds. Glancing to his left and right, he could see the company largely agreed with the decision. They were all ducked down in cover, waiting, thinking about the dwindling supply of evacuation ships. Ten seconds. Five. He cringed and hoped that it wouldn't be him. Wham! A loud concussive blast rattled him and the crate. The dust settled in Station Mevian's eighth cargo bay, and Zarnath took the opportunity to quickly glance over the crate. It looked the same. 800 meters of poor cover, scorch marks, no visibility in the heavy smoke, and shot out lights, no dark soldiers advancing. His duty as watch completed, he ducked back down and started counting out the two minutes until the next long-range explosive would hit. There were a few blind shots fired around corners, just enough that it looked like the soldiers were doing their jobs. When Zana settled back down, he saw a figure walking towards him, standing tall without a care in the world. He carried a heavy lump of boxy metal with a long barrel ending in a knife. It had a thick belt running into a box hanging off the human's hip. He was in a dark grey camouflage, marked him as part of the Massivan's militia, but was walking like an oblivious civilian, and the bright red pointed hat he wore negated any benefit of the camouflage. As Zarnath watched, a few laser shots cracked through the air as though demonstrating his point. Get down, shouted Zarnath. It's no use ducking. The bullets are already past you. Who is in command here? Former officer Zildar, uh, um, sir. Uh, former? Zarnath nodded over to his side, where a mound of smoldering grain lay. It had blown out of a shipment their officer had been using for cover. The human clucked his tongue looked out towards the dark lines and nodded. I think that's the bugger who took a shot at me, he said. Zana had lost count of when the next explosion would hit, but if the human could stand in broad view of the enemy, he could peek over the crate. He brought his binoculars and scanned the far wall past the landed broken husks of the failed defense fleet where the human had nodded. Sure enough, he saw a dull gray shape huddled down, Broken fighter, 12 o'clock, by the nose on the floor, 707 meters, the dull gray ship, called Zarnath into his radio without taking his eyes off the ship. The screen flashed white for a few moments, clearing and adjusting its brightness to reveal a glowing buckled bulkhead and remnants of the fighter's nose cone. Yes, that was him. Good shot to your brother. Well, cheerio, he said, and started waltzing off towards the enemy at a leisurely stroll. Sir, uh, where are you going? Uh, the talks are over there. I'm uh, not much use back here. Uh, there isn't any cover. The human stopped and considered that for a moment. We can make a run for it. Are your men up for a bit of a jog? Zarna looked about his company to see all eyes on him and his odd conversation partner. They looked hopeful for the first time since they had entered the damned level. We'll all go at once, said Zarna. A warm smile greeted him in return from the human before a whistle was lifted to his lips. It shrieked out as the only warning before the human started running. There was a loud concussion of the latest two-minute explosion. If there was a time to run, it was now. Zarnath rose and took after the officer, keeping his head low as he ran. There was a loud shocking thunder belching from the human's gun, a repeated dak dak dak. He remembered the human words. There is no point ducking, the shots have already passed you, and rose to his full height filling his lungs with air and keeping his eyes on the enemy's cover. Laser fire came their way, and he raised his rifle, echoing shots back at the little sparking muzzles flashing from the dark rifles. Soon his whole team was firing and running behind him, albeit a bit off in the distance. The human, however, had no such regard for his safety, charging alone towards the enemy at the front. The fire slowed, probably due to the unknown terrifying weapon in the human's hands. All Zarnath had to do was follow that red hat as it slowly faded into the thickening smoke. Whenever doubt crept in, he heard that weapon and knew safety lie on the other side. Even as he lost sight of that hat, he could run towards the shots. The smoke, clear, illuminated by small fires, then he found the human slumped down against the crate by the enemy's now silent mortar. 
the knife extending from the human's weapon, dripping in dark blood from the corpses that lay around him. The human's clothes started to stain the same color as his hat. Uh, hello again, in a bit of a spot of bother. Uh, could you do me a favor? Zarnath knelt down, then flinched as the human fired off another burst from an automatic rifle that hung slack. He wasn't shooting at anything, just shooting for the sake of it. Zarnath opened his medical kit, unsure of what he had that was compatible with human anatomy. Your hat? Oh, well, yes, but uh, can you keep her firing? The men like it, said the human. Zarnath was held by the steady gaze. It was the first time that he had seen the human look serious. Zarnath nodded, his head dipping low so the shoulder strap could be passed over to him. They won't be able to evacuate the whole station. There is only one way to save those who will be left behind, said the human before slapping the red hat on Zarnath's head. End of story. Story number two. Wait, you've been recording this whole time, written by Drifty241. Colonial Fleet 3, Daily Log, Asleech Time 3. This is Admiral Chow aboard the Chexel class cruiser Conviction. We found a habitable planet. Atmospheric readings are still coming through, but it's mostly nitrogen with oxygen, carbon dioxide and a small dash of argon, which is a bit unusual, but it won't affect us. As for the planet itself, it is the third planet away from its star, and has a large moon. It's made up of three land masses, and it started with a shallow sea filled with the peninsulas and islands. We are assembling a party to go down and scout a mountainous peninsula. It's between two shallow seas, which are separated by a tiny strait. Colonial Fleet 3 Daily Log 2 We found uh, primitives. They are bipedal, which is rather rare in the galaxy and they are covered in small, wiry spikes which collect at the top of their skull. Their brain size is standard, so they're probably sapient. There is a center of civilization on this peninsula. We'll land and make contact. Colonial Fleet 3, Daily Log 3. And touchdown! The ride down was a bit bumpy, but nothing too serious. We spotted a city to the west and have sent some scouts that way. Colonial Fleet 3, Daily Log 4. We ran into some of these aliens. They're called Anthropos. Uh, there's not much else we've gathered from linguistics. But the settlement to the west is called Abydos. We're still heading that way. Colonial Three Fleet Daily Log 5. We arrived at the river east of Abydos. There was a large battle going on, bigger than anything anyone in the galaxy had ever seen. The Anthropos were fighting, adorning helmets of iron and bronze and riding quadrupedal demons with feet of steel and muscly body. These creatures are clearly the spawn of the Dark Gods. One man stood out, smashing his enemy lines with a group of elites and routing them. More linguistics came through. He's called Alexander, and he's a king of Macedonia and all of the healers. Their weapons were strange too, rods of malleable material tipped with steel. We think it comes from a large plant that we keep finding, but uh, hey, we managed to catch the whole battle on camera via drone, so it should entertain the troops. Colonial Fleet 3, Daily Log 6. More scouts were sent out, and they brought back reports from the Houseborn, hailing from the north the giant muscly creatures with claws and massive jaws. To the south are giant demons, the large ears, spears of natural iron, and a thick armored hide. Then there's the agile creatures the Anthropos have tamed in smaller sizes. This planet is a curse. End of log. Four days later, Asleech Palace. Your Majesty, these Anthropos are dangerous. Admiral Cheel was found within the stone sticking out of his head from a crude projectile weapon. If anyone makes landfall there, they will meet a quick end, said the advisor in a low voice. The emperor boomed back. Very well. I declare an exclusion zone of 100 light years in every direction. Furthermore, I want pros with high magnification in orbit and a base on the planet's moon. In a scared voice, the advisor said, Why, my lord, should we risk any more lives? Look, I've seen that video of the battle on that river. And it's the most entertaining thing I've seen in a while, said the Emperor. 
I'm going to televise their battles on my streaming service and make it available to every other civilization in the galaxy. Think of how good that'll be for the economy. 2,700 years later, Galactic Union Senate. It was diplomatic Charlie's turn to speak. Humanity has just been inducted into the wider galactic community. And with that, the spying from aliens had come to light. Wait, you're telling me you have historical footage from the Battle of Granicus River all the way to 2234 AD? That's invaluable knowledge for our archives. Uh, can you show us some of it? The aging emperor chuckled. Sure, this one's a fan favorite. Two alien commentators appeared on the screen, Von Oketa and Asilex Zeptos. They began talking. Welcome to the show, everyone. And would you look at that? Fan favorite Napoleon is at it again. He he's fighting some Austrians, Prussians, and Russians at Austerlitz. Thoughts, Foda? Said Asilex. Napoleon is a real winner, but to cement himself as one of the greats with Alexander and Hannibal, he's going to have to win this battle, and it ain't gonna be easy. The odds are stacked against him. What followed was pure hysterical footage of the occupational quips from the commentators. Oh my god! And he's breaking the ice with his artillery! I wonder what the folks home are thinking right now! He's a true genius! I sure hope I get to see the end of his intelligence someday, said Vona. Well, I'm not sure about you, Vona, but I've still got another 600 years left, replied Asilex. As the battle reached its conclusion, Vona began speaking. Well, uh, the fighting is dying down now, but... But I just want to mention that this route is sponsored by Chizexel Games and their now hit mobile game Attack of the Elephants. It has multiple human weapons and you must defend yourself from the demons of their planets for as long as possible. Download now for free. Asilix spoke one more time. Well, that victory is definitely going to affect the betting economy. Charlie was stunned. The aliens had marketed millennia of human bloodshed and he couldn't help but laugh at the absurdity of it. End of story. I'd quickly like to thank the T5 peeps. But Mori, Terran on Air, Cold War, Boom of Offen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Lightjock, Dragzoon WRE, Lord Azrakal, and Arcadian. Thank you.